Um, part of the inner work for me is a constant search for language, right? Language that is better suited for the times that we are alive in. So I try my best to speak in terms of energy, right relations, light modalities of being, taking cognizance of the fact that there is a reason why we call it spelling. We're literally casting spells when we speak, when we write, when we use language and do so with strong emotion. Language is a magic. It's a powerful force because it shapes our everyday lives. It animates the mundane choices and the daily decisions we make as individuals, as a society, as a species. So I've personally found it spiritually important to pay attention to how I use language in my life. I try to pay attention to the stories that run in my mind because that influences my choices and behaviors. The narratives shape the modalities of being in the world. The sword of life and death is wielded by the tongue. You know, um, I think that language and stories are important because one of the reasons why white supremacy as a system and as an ontology has endured for so long and continues to endure is because it exists in the mundane. It lives in the everyday who, what, and how, who we are, who we speak to, what we are, what we speak to, how we are, and how we speak. It's made stronger in the choices of phrases we use unthinkingly. For example, one of my pet peeves, I found that the phrase to play devil's advocate is always followed by some devilish situation. And so for me, <laughs> I always immediately ask, who is this devil? Why are you their advocate? And what makes you think I want to play this game with you? I don't play games with the devil, nor do I have patience or tolerance for his advocates. So whenever I hear someone say this to me, I immediately know to have my wits about me around this person because they clearly do not have consciously guarded their spiritual doors. And the conscious guarding of spiritual doors, I found, requires balance. Yeah. So my name is Ashanti. And whenever I bring someone into my friendship circle, I ask them to call me Shanti. Shanti in Sanskrit means peace and harmony. So for those of you that meditate and are familiar with the mantra, Shanti Om, Shanti Om, Shanti Om, you're calling peace and harmony over your mind, body, and spirit. I've always been called Shanti. It's what my family and my loved ones call me. Shanti is the soft, bubbly, loving, peaceful, childlike version of me. Yeah. Ashanti, on the other hand, in Sanskrit, means war and chaos. That's the warrior queen version of me. My mother named me after Ya Asantawa of Ghana, who led the war of the Golden Stool against the British in the 1900s. That queen mother was not about to allow the men of the Ashanti tribe to behave like cowards and give up the Ashanti throne to the invading colonial power. And not on my watch, we shall fight or die trying. Yeah? So when you call me Ashanti, you're calling the no-nonsense, get it done, or I deal with you swiftly version of me. She is my shadow. Shanti is my light. And my daily spiritual practice is to, at all times, try my best to be in coherence, to be in harmony, and to be in balance with my moon and my sun, with my shadow and my light, with my evil and my divine. A friend of mine likes to say I'm the balance of extremes. We are alive in a really interesting, chaotic time. <laughs> and we are all complicit in one way or another in creating and upholding a, you know, civilization, a society, a center of normative values where evil, bad behavior is accepted um, and deemed part of our nature, of normality, of our reality. Yeah. And while I may not necessarily disagree that there is evil in human nature, I think part of the complexity of being a human is our capacity to grapple and deal with darkness, with really murderously evil energy and alchemize that into higher energetic frequencies. I think it's part of the machinations of how free will operates on this plane, that contradiction and lived experience is what makes achieving inner peace so mag magical and what and why bliss can be what it is, right? The existence of darkness is how I understand we're able to recognize light, but darkness cannot, does not exist without light. And that's where I disagree with the 
I suppose, common understanding that humans are inherently evil, that our starting point is sin, our starting point is darkness. I think life and living is a little bit more interesting than that. I think there are choices we make about the modalities of being, of how we are in the world. They are modalities of being that we are taught and socialized into. And then they are the modality of, of modalities of being that we choose uh, on the day to day. So the, pra the practice of the Zulu principle of Ubuntu, 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 Ngabantu, I am human because you are human. To be able to practice that is something that you would have to choose in your day to day. It's what I spoke to earlier about white supremacy living, living in the who, the what and the how, who we see as other and what we believe that makes them other shapes how we engage others. And practicing the principle of Ubuntu means understanding that there is no other, for all comes from one source, the essence of the same. I am, I am who I am because you are you. You are a reflection of me and vice versa. And so it's try, maybe put that in the context of racism and race, narratives of race. So the overarching narrative is that white people are superior and black people are inferior. And so if you as a white person wake up with the conscious belief in your racial superiority, there's a particular way in which you're going to move through the world. There's a specific energetic pattern that comes with that belief. And so anything you do or say as an ally in that belief will not translate as allyship, it will translate as racism, yeah? And then on the other hand, if I, as a black person, wake up with the conscious belief in my racial inferiority, there's a specific way I'm going to move through the world and a specific energetic pattern I'm going to carry that will ensure that every single encounter I have with a white person, racist or not, will result in my feeling and being victimized, which then legitimizes the white man's burden to help those victims in need. And therein lies the rub. You need both racial narratives, you need the conscious spiritual acceptance and agreement of the people to uphold that system, right? You need the black person to agree and accept in their inferiority for the white person to be superior. And I think that the future, future of consciousness depends on our collective ability to recognize these things for what they are and to let them go.